All right, so we'll launch the polls. So there's four questions and you can answer one um, once for each question. Are people seeing the poll? Yes. Yeah. So do participants see the poll list come do you, do you see the results coming up or is it just the host we can i can see it claire uh one quick question we could only yep. select one up uh one item in each question that's uh, right and so we're doing multiple like 4x and pro ex and oh, okay and so okay and i guess some people may be working with multiple systems okay. as well with cultured yeah. cells and yeah, so maybe pick the, the one you're using the most. Um, this is really just to inform our groups. So, all right. So I think if I end the poll, we should, uh, it should come up uh, for everybody. So I, I think there's still a couple people who haven't answered. I'll maybe give one more minute. Okay, so do you see the results now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I always see them. So it looks like we have a good mix of level of experience. So um, we were chatting a little bit beforehand. It's good. We're, we're going to uh, put all the pressure on the people with moderate and expert experience to, to guide the rest of us <laughs> who are just getting into this. Um, so we have a lot of people who are interested. So we, we did notice in the in the emails and requests we received that a lot of people are interested in 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 the technique, but maybe aren't doing it yet. Um, so that's about a third of us, I guess. And then um, some people are are trying to implement it about half, and then um, others are doing it successfully and are here to help, which is great. Uh, looks like we have a fair number of different um, model systems too, um, cultured cells, tissue sections, and then um, one C. elegans. And then we will um, save the chat as well. I don't know if uh, anybody specified in the chat if they're using other or other organisms, but uh, um, or other systems. Please feel free to do that as well. And then. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people who aren't doing it yet, so that's not applicable, but 4X, 10X, and then a few in between. So, and as the comment said, I guess there may be people doing more than one. Um, I think our plan right now is to start with 4X, just where I think the sample handling, I guess, can be quite challenging with the 10X. So we were, we were planning to start with 4X, but uh, that's good to see. All right, so thank you. Um, for answering those questions, that helps us uh, get an idea of the the sort of uh, demographic of the group and what people are are hoping to get out of this uh, this user group. Um, so we were going to have a, a couple of um, people present some of their work just to kind of guide our discussion a little bit, and I think we can we can have those one presentation and a bit of Q and A and then the second presentation, a bit of Q and A, and then maybe we can come back after that to um, kind of what we what we want to get out of the group, how we want to communicate. Is there a you know an end product we want to have? Do we want to work on a, on a common protocol or or um, you know find it, find different ways to share um, what we're doing? And maybe um, Natalie, do you want me to run maybe that first word cloud just to to introduce people to that before we have the first presentation? Yeah, sure. But I think um, the first, so yeah, the first question would be asking about the fluorophores, right? That's the one you're referring to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that. Uh, okay. 
So we also wanted to uh, to get a little bit of information about what people have found is working or not working already. And uh, we thought we'd do it as a word cloud to make it a little more interesting than, than just typing in the chat. Um, so we have a, a link here that you can go to and you'll be able to see the questions and answer them. And you'll be able to, to uh, answer more than once. So you can put up to 10, 10 replies into the, into the quest for each question. So I will put the link in the chat and then I'll just uh, share the slide. So we'll just answer the first question for now. So the question was, uh, what organic fluorophores have worked best for expansion? So we were specifically looking for organic fluorophores and not um, fluorescent proteins. And as people put entries in, it should populate the word cloud. And then if you see a, um, a fluorophore that someone else has put, if you also put it, it'll, it'll change the size of the word so that we can get a sense of um, which ones people are using, more people are using. So just thinking we have to get them to, to change the algorithm so the colors come up bright. <laughs> So it looks like the Alexa dyes are quite good and, and Addo. Oh, thanks for the, the note, Michelle. I probably, I just used a free version, so I probably have to pay for it to get more people in. I'll look at, I'll look at that for next time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. If you want to put them in the chat, if you can't get into the poll, then, then that will work. So we have a, a couple of other questions for the for the word cloud, but I think we'll we'll come back to them after. So, and we'll we'll merge them with the comments in the chat. So, thanks for that. All right. So Natalie, if you want to go ahead, we could go to the first presentation. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so we have two presenters today. We have George Campbell and. Um, Professor Javier. So I don't know if either of you has a preference or who wants to go first, but um, yeah, really excited to hear your talk. I think. Well, I can go first if you don't mind. All right. Um, let me try to share my screen. All of you are watching my screen? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so, all right. Uh, my name is Javier Diez Guerra, and I work in the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, which you can see a panoramic just on the upper side. Uh, this is the place where I teach, and uh, the Centro de Biología Molecular Severo Ochoa is the place where I do my research. All the work that I am going to present has been done by a graduate student, Miguel Serrano Lope, which did the end-of-degree end project uh, last academic year. Well, as you know, um, expansion microscopy gives you a chance to improve uh, at a very low cost, uh, the resolution uh, achieved by light microscopy. Actually, we get a more or less a four or five plus resolution improvement over expansion microscopy. <clears throat> and it's you see, I mean, uh, what are the results when uh, things go well? Uh, you can see, I mean, these beautiful images, which uh, are just uh, post-expansion microscopy um, 
uh, images of uh, uh, previously uh, fixed and stained um, preparation. Our work is uh, most related with uh, synaptic plasticity, and we are interested in how biochemical signal events are related to, uh, let me see if I can, okay. Uh, are related to uh, events of synaptic plasticity, efficiency, and remodeling. So for that, uh, okay. Uh, this is our model of uh, synapse uh, centered on the um, postsynaptic side in which uh, different mechanisms uh, of signaling that uh, take place after the entrance of calcium into the dendritic spine could lead to different responses. <clears throat> also, um, we have uh, focus on a protein which is very abundant in the forebrain, hippocampus, amygdala, uh, cerebral cortex. His uh, 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 localization at the subcellular level is uh, mainly somatodendritic, and this protein binds to calmodulin and acts as a calmodulin sequester protein. So uh, this protein um, more or less is uh, taking place at the regulation of the signaling that goes beyond the calcium interns so that CAM uh, 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 targets are differentially uh, activated depending on how much neogranin we have into the dendritic spines. We uh, very recently find out, found out that uh, this protein, neurogranin, binds to a lipid, a phospholipid in the membrane, which is phosphatidic acid, that acts as a signaling lipid and can be produced in the dendritic spine by uh, activation of the metabotropic glutamate uh, receptors. So we're interested in whether this uh, accumulation of this lipid could be signaling the translocation of neogranin into the dendritic spine and at the same time taking with it uh, calmodulin so that uh, there is an enrichment in uh, calmodulin within uh, particular spines that could alter the um, balance between potentiation and depreciation. And, and depression. So this is how it looks, our protein in the mouse adult uh, hippocampus, as you see, is expressed in uh, pyramidal neurons and also in the granular layer of the adult mouse hippocampus. And also uh, we can see it in a culture of hippocampal neurons obtained from mouse or rat, in which uh, uh, here you see uh, a typical staining with uh, our antibodies against this protein together with MAP2, DAPI, and this is the merge. Uh, our interest is as I said, in the dendritic spine. So if you look uh, closely, uh, you see that our protein is uh, concentrated or at least is localized in the, these uh, protuberances that uh, emerge from the dendritic uh, uh, shafts. So our question is uh, uh, that we want to um, um, deal with expansion microscopy it's just a study of the translocation of this protein as a function of synaptic activity. So for that, uh, we have used uh, um, culture cells. We have used a, a cell line, and I will explain in shortly why we use that, and our typical primary cultures of hippocampal neurons. We follow a typical uh, fixation, permeabilization, and blocking steps uh, for the pre-embedding uh, immunohistochemistry. And then we just leave overnight this reagent just to proceed with the expansion protocol, which as you see is uh, the same protocol that is uh, described in this web page that was maintained by the Media Lab at the MIT, the group of uh, Dr. Boyden. 
So this in, uh, implies uh, jellification first, then a digestion with proteinase K, and then an expansion protocol. Uh, we used and we built in a 3D printer uh, these devices, uh, which are very useful just to immobilize the gel that we obtain and avoid movement, which is a, you know, a great hassle when you're imaging the, the gels uh, after um, expansion. Further, um, we just check with different first and primary and secondary antibodies, different dilution factors, different uh, degrees of cross-linking by changing the acryl-bisacryl uh, ratios, and then several um, dilutions of the protein K. So I mean, to see what uh, uh, were the results. Uh, this is um, the workflow that we are uh, currently, well, I mean, we, we stopped that since, uh, I mean, the undergraduate student just left uh, the the lab and we, we are not uh, working with that. But I mean, that that work implied this uh, kind of different steps in which we normally uh, take two different slides, one for pre-XM imaging, and the other one, which should be more or less identical to the first, for, go to the uh, workflow for uh, the expansion. As you see here, this is the incubation of the acrolail, then the jellification, digestion, and then the expansion, and later on the imaging of the post-expansion uh, uh, samples. Um, I have prepared a, a very detailed protocol of what we are doing, which implies these, uh, all these blocks that I can share if you wish, but I, I wouldn't uh, detail uh, now uh, at this moment. Um, we uh, have a first surprise because we were looking for a cell line which expresses the protein, which is uh, mainly a protein which is expressed in the nervous system. And we, after searching databases and uh, check with our antibodies, we found that this cell line, uh, color uh, uh, 3 and 20, uh, expresses uh, neurogranin. So this is something uh, serendipitous, but uh, I mean, uh, this uh, help us uh, quite a lot to uh, improve and you know to accelerate all the setup that uh, was later uh, adapted for the hippocampal neurons. So as you see here, um, this is not an expansion. This is just uh, a, a small part that uh, I have been uh, uh, magnified. Uh, but uh, you see the dotted uh, distribution of this protein, which is um, very uh, typical of this protein. I mean, this protein is called neogranin because it distributes in cells such as small grains. We, we just checked that uh, by Western blood with two different antibodies, uh, polyclonal from sheep and from rabbit. And uh, so we started doing uh, the first experiment with this uh, cell line. Here, uh, I show you results uh, in which uh, we stain the uh, cells with uh, DAPI to visualize the nuclei with tubulin and also with neurogranin. These are the pre-expansion uh, images and these are the post-expansion images. So, so far, so good. We were quite happy that we could see uh, these uh, expanded uh, um, images of these very small uh, cells in which uh, resolution was uh, dramatically improved. Further, when you and when we went to the cultures of uh, hippocampal neurons, we started with uh, easy staining, such as this uh, of uh, MAP2, which is a, a protein which is uh, uh, associated to the microtubules. 
and is specific of neurons. In here I present you on the left side, it is a whole image, uh, I mean, the, 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 the whole field of view of uh, 20x um, objective. Uh, uh, what, uh, this is what comes out in the camera. And this is after expansion, what we saw uh, when we uh, performed the post-expansion uh, experiment. Uh, further, uh, we were looking at um, the expansion um, characteristics of our protein of interest, neurogranin. On the upper row, you have uh, the results obtained on pre-expansion and on the lower row with post-expansion. And we did that with two different antibodies, one made in sheep and the other in rabbit. As you see, um, pre-expansion with uh, well high aperture uh, lenses, um, we could uh, define quite well the location and the distribution of uh, dendritic spines. However, when we expanded the samples, uh, although we still can see uh, the dendritic spines, uh, it was much more difficult to distinguish from the background. So uh, we think that at this stage, we had uh, quite a lot of improvement to be done. We don't know uh, whether, I mean, these images reflect the real distribution or not of this protein, since we expect, as you see, uh, to have uh, this dotted distribution within the dendritic shaft, and we actually didn't know how to expect the expression or the distribution within the dendritic spines. Nevertheless, we continue with um, a study, a physiological study, in which we analyze pre-expanded and post-expanded images before, during, and after inducing a chemical LTP. So although uh, we could clearly see um, a difference, I mean, a, an increase in the volume of uh, the dendritic spines during, active, uh, during LTP that was maintained later on for several minutes, it was much more difficult to analyze, statistically analyze the images that we obtained from uh, expanded uh, images. We were hoping to see more clearly the translocation between the dendritic shaft and, and the dendritic spines. So um, we end up with the conclusions that we had to um, uh, analyze quite a few of these uh, images and uh, several batches to uh, end up to a conclusion in which uh, we can uh, see whether there is or not a translocation of this protein. Although only with uh, pre-expansion images, we uh, have the feeling, uh, I mean, not uh, certainly, and we cannot see that there are significant data, that uh, there is a translocation uh, within the spines just during the LTP induction procedure. So just to, to finish, uh, I have just put together several things that went well when we uh, started doing this uh, or approaching these techniques. Uh, we had much better results with the cell line, which is more, much, I mean, it's easier to work with than hippocampal neurons. We also observed um, something that was described, which is the expansion factors were well in agree with what was described. Also, uh, we analyzed and uh, set up conditions for different antibodies to different proteins uh, in the synaptic environment. And we are now uh, have clear which are the conditions in terms of dilution and so on. And uh, also uh, we saw a clear distribution and localization of neogranin in dendritic spines. So for us, uh, it's been a, well, not so costly uh, technique to just improve the resolution of our studies 
that uh, we hope that uh, with the help of these uh, the members of this work, work group, uh, we can, um, you know, um, better. And uh, finally, we uh, just made uh, a, a list of things that uh, were not so well. Uh, maybe uh, those have, that you have uh, started to work with this technique uh, have uh, appreciated that uh, fluorescence is uh, decreased. Uh, is decreased quite a lot uh, when you after expansion. And then this is uh, this forces to increase the primary and secondary antibodies concentrations, which could lead to unspecificity. This is one of the problem. Uh, a second problem is that the height of the gel sometimes prevents, uh, especially with the uh, high magnification uh, objectives, to uh, reach the plane where the cells are located within the gel. And sometimes we didn't uh, very easily find the cell. So uh, I remember Miguel was uh, spending quite a lot of time uh, just looking for the cells and, you know, going up and down with the SETA drive. Um, another thing that we uh, experience is that although we see uh, microtubules in the pre expansion images, as continuous lines, sometimes after expansion, we do not see continuous lines, but also dotted lines. And we um, thought that maybe uh, this could be due that the antibodies are not saturating the, the entire length of the microtubule. Otherwise, I mean, it could be an effect of uh, excess of proteinase. Regarding uh, fluorofrost, as, as you have said, uh, we started with Alexa 647, but uh, we have very poor results with this fluorofrost. And this has been uh, described. We later found out that this uh, CF660R uh, fluorofor and those come in uh, fluorofors in the CI5 channel. Uh, that are commercialized by a barrier work much, much better for this. And we also try Brilliant Violet for to one, um, but with very mixed results. Sometimes uh, expansion were better and sometimes were horrible. So um, uh, more or less, uh, this is the things that uh, I want to say. I mean, and this is our very limited experience and very basic stuff that we have been doing during four months last year, the time that this undergraduate was uh, concentrated on this, on this project. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'm prepared to try to uh, answer any question that may arise. I have a question about I have Matt Coffrin at Cincinnati Children's. Uh, the Brilliant Violet 421, um, what specifically were the problems you had? Lack of expansion of the tissue or the signal was inconsistent between preparations? We, we lost the signal after expansion. We, we normally uh, mix DAPI and uh, Brilliant Violet 421. Since uh, DAPI only labels nuclei, very uh, specifically, and we tend to uh, bring MAP2 into this channel so that, I mean, we can have both in the same channel without uh, many problems. Uh, but uh, our experience is that after, um, after expansion, we lost quite a lot of uh, fluorescence. I mean, uh, brilliant violet is uh, is is like a change of uh, fluorophores one after the other, which increase quite a lot the extinction coefficient of these fluorochrome, and I mean it works quite better. It's, for... it's a molecular antenna. We use it all the time. Mm. Uh, we have not tried it in expansion yet, uh, mm. and are gearing up to do that. Uh, uh -huh. We would do it probably in lieu of DAPI. Did you try it without DAPI? 
No, the, uh, we have the same results. I mean, we we decided just to mix one uh, both because uh, I mean you always want to see more things in the same uh, sample or preparation. We want to just uh, uh, take advantage of, uh, I mean, that we can mix these together and we can have four fluorochromes in the same sample altogether. Are you, are you thinking that the DAPI could be quenching the brilliant violet? Well, not or something quenching like so much as, you know, DAPI, the DNA is tightly uh, wound up in histones, when you hit it with proteinase K, you're going to expand that, but it's still going to bind the DAPI. So your signal for the DNA stain with DAPI is going to be potentially much higher in the post-expansion sample, whereas your mm -hmm. fluorophore dilution due to increase of the volume for the BB421 may make the signal much lower, you know, your photon right. yeah. much lower. So my guess is if you tried it without the yeah. DAPI. Um, yeah, but I mean, we started like that. As you say, I mean, yeah. we started just only with brilliant violet. You did just do brilliant violet. You lost yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, I can assure you that uh, it's a bad fluorochrome uh, since we have mixed results. And, well, uh, so I when, cannot. So some of these fluor fluorophores, um, you know, Thermo Fisher, I know this is a BD, but Thermo Fisher will not tell you if it's a cyanine dye or not. Um, so we test that empirically. And you know, you can deactivate Alexa 647 just by putting it in a reaction with free radicals. It'll, you know, uh, unsaturate the or saturate the uh, double bonds in the linker. And did you did you test anything like that with the BV four twenty one to see if you could lose fluorescence? Okay, that's we'll we'll end up probably trying that. And did you try BV four eighty? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and we also have some questions in the chat. Um, first one, somebody asked, "How do you cut the gel to fit tightly in your sample support?" Uh, sorry, I'm looking. Is the last one that uh, appears in the chat? No, it was the very first one, the first the question that came up. Um, so you mentioned you had a 3D yeah. printed support, right? Well, we, we punch it. We, we use a, a punch of a certain diameter. And once we have it in the P150 um, dish, and this is fully expanded what we do is uh, to punch it and we just uh, take a kind of cylinder that fits into into this uh, let me see this is the the thing that we use for just we we place a, a cover slip down there then the gel and then another cover slips to prevent evaporation. Uh, well, we we have to cut it manually sometimes because in uh, microscope it didn't fit well. And actually, I mean, this is um, a three D printer uh, printer uh, file that you can find in the Lucas Captain uh, paper, and you can download and and do it. Uh, I recommend to just make the base, all the base of the plastic, a little bit um, um, wider, I mean, uh, thicker, so that, uh, I mean, it doesn't bend very easily. It depends on the plastic that, that you use. But uh, what we do is just to take uh, the the gel in the uh, in the dish, punch it, and then place it on top of a cover slip. Just fix it here, which has exactly the same diameter, and then place another cover slip uh, on top of that. And that's the way that we are doing the post expansion imaging. Okay. And there was another question that asked, so how do you orientate or did you orientate the gel before imaging? Because the cells should be on one side. Well, we expect to have the, yes, I mean, uh, this is very important since the cells are always on one side of, of the gel. And uh, it's very important not to lose the, the, the side. Uh, 
But uh, sometimes I'm not sure why reason, since there are some very high um, uh, numerical aperture objects that have a very, very short working distance, um, parts of the gel uh, polymerize or just uh, cover the, the surface uh, where the, um, the, the cells were uh, attached to, I mean, the cover slip. And so this is in, uh, this increase the the length, and and this is increases the the distance that we have to uh, to take just to uh, find uh, the cells. As I told you, with uh, cells which are very abundant, that's uh, such as the cell line that uh, I, I told you, that's very easy because uh, you find cells ev almost everywhere. However, when you are doing hypocampal neurons and you want to culture them in low density, I mean, to be able to see spines and connections and so on, uh, sometimes this uh, gets uh, difficult to do. Okay. And now one, well, I guess one more person, last person with two questions. The first is, what effects did you observe on changing the ratios of acrylamide or by sacrolamide and different dilutions of protein K? Well, with uh, different ratios of uh, acryl and bisacrylamide, uh, what you get is different degrees of expansion. So, I mean, this is it's being described. So, okay. I mean, uh, it depends on how big you want to make your, uh, your gel. And with proteinase K, uh, Proteinase K uh, is difficult. I think, uh, well, I, I advise just to do uh, on-site, I mean, with your particular sample. Since uh, there are proteins which are very abundant in the cells and they are not very much affected and others are, I mean, not so abundant and maybe, I mean, you're in risk of losing them. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, she asks, how do you store the gels post-expansion and imaging? And about how long does the fluorescent state and actually last? Mm, well, no, uh, we just image just uh, after the expansion in uh, 24, 48 hours after that. And we, I mean, if we have to uh, wait uh, because, I mean, we don't have the microscope uh, confocal available, we just keep it on four, eight degrees on the cold chamber. Yes, and uh, cover with foil to avoid. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I think that was the last question. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, that was really, really informative. And it's interesting to hear how uh, you, you said it was only like a four month um, project, but it seems like there, there was a lot of work done within those four months. Mm, do you mean formal? Or did you, uh, well, you mentioned that it was only an undergrad who. Yeah. Yes. This. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's very was, impressive. Yeah. Well, actually there was another person. I mean, I, I think I just uh, created, I mean, this image was done by another one who stayed only for one month. And uh, well, I mean, he he took over the you know the level of expertise that Miguel had reached before, and then he proceeded with that. Our goal with uh, during this stay was just to go through um, to tissue. I mean, to label tissue, but uh, we weren't so successful with the tissue as we were with. Um, with uh, culture cells. Mm -hmm. All right, um, thank you so much. And I think, uh, so we're cutting a little bit close with time. So we're gonna move on to George Campbell who will be from St. Jude um, Children's Research Hospital. We'll be uh, presenting a bit more about his project. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me get this shared properly. 
Um, so I work in the Cell and Tissue Imaging Center, the Institutional Light Microscopy Corps. And so we're, we've been trying to get uh, expansion micro, microscopy kind of working well in my hands so that I can then uh, assist researchers in implementing it for their projects. Um, so I just wanted to share some of the things I've learned kind of, you know, the, the hard way um, and maybe some useful uh, things that you could implement yourself. Um, so I, I kind of removed a lot of the explanation of expansion microscopy and focus just on these few, few key perspectives. So this is uh, the same gel that's been imaged before and after expansion with the 63X water objective on a spinning disc microscope. Um, this is not the same cell. Um, that would be quite hard to find. I should probably try to do that sometime. Um, but this is just showing tubulin staining uh, before and after expansion, um, which as you know, you all know, tubulin is quite a useful uh, tool to study for super, mi super resolution microscopy um, and just in general. Um, I have another example here uh, with mitochondria, nuclei, and microtubules um, with, from HeLa cells. And um, so the method we've been focusing on is the tenfold robust expansion microscopy method, which is from uh, Paul Tilburg's group at Genalia. Um, so for this method, we do routine IF to prepare the samples. Uh, we do the anchoring step with the Acro Oil X overnight. Uh, we've been focusing on the low magnification uh, T-Rex protocol, so only the 4X expansion. Um, we, of course, want to use the 10X as well, but I've been having trouble getting that to work uh, successfully. Um, for gel casting, uh, we use a parafilm wrap slide. We have a silicone spacer, which I'll show a picture of in the next slide, I believe. Um, and then the cover slip will be placed on top of that. Uh, we do a proteinase K uh, digestion, like in the T-Rex paper. Um, for orientation, we quickly check with a 20x lens before mounting it onto a coated cover slip. So for our mounting, we use uh, 35 millimeter dishes with a wide cover slip base, and we coat that with poly -L lysine um, to hold them in place. The microscope we've primarily been using are one of our two spinning disc confocals with either the the X, the CSUX or the CSUW. And I'll explain a difference we've noticed between those. Um, we have a nice high QE uh, Prime 95B camera. Um, and then we've been imaging with a high NA water immersion lens. Um, so one of the things I've had to kind of deal with is only doing expansion microscopy occasionally, because um, I have a lot of other responsibilities in the facility. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of do this on the side along with when a researcher is interested, I can jump in with them and get started. Um, so one thing I have found useful is to aliquot and freeze the gel reaction mixtures and then just add the TMED and APS on the day of uh, the gel casting. Um, I prepare all of this on ice. Um, with the TMED and the APS, and then uh, build the gel chamber uh, on that day. Um, what we found useful for casting the gels to exact sizes are these silicon spacers, um, which are from Grace Biolabs. Um, and this way, we can kind of start at a particular size and then expand by a factor of four, and then remeasure uh, the gel after expansion. Um, I've been working with these round ones originally. More recently, I got these square ones, which will help with orientation because then I can uh, cut off a corner and more easily assess uh, which side is which. Um, and in some of the uh, expansion papers, they did mention uh, that the open edges in the gel reaction chambers um, can be an issue. So I also um, liked these silicone spacers for that point. Um, I believe the first time I saw this idea was in the T-Rex the paper, um, although I don't think they were using these exact products. They were using some other type of silicone material. Um, these also have a uh, defined depth, which is nice because um, you get 
a certain size of gel. Um, and then um, as we heard before, getting the gels to stay still is a challenge. So you can see in this Z stack with microtubules, mitochondria and uh, nuclei or DNA uh, visualized, uh, the gels move if you're not careful, um, which can affect your um, 3D imaging or just want 2D imaging if you have long exposure times. Um, and so I, I tried a couple of things um, kind of stubbornly because uh, I had trouble getting the poly L lysine coating of cover slips to work at first. So I tried with nothing and that doesn't work very well. Um, I tried weighing the gels down with different actually with excess 3D printer plastic uh, pieces that we had laying around, um, it, just a variety of different things. And that doesn't work very well because it was I found it quite difficult to balance anything um, on top of the gels um, to stabilize the gels. It worked intermittently, but not reproducibly. Um, you can also just reduce the amount of water in the dish, which isn't good if you do any long uh, experiments because your gels at risk for um, dehydrating. Um, so what I found to work was the polyolysine treatment, which is all over uh, expansion literature. Um, I, I found that kind of a lower recommend a lower concentration of polyolysine than uh, what had been suggested works. Um, so I believe usually I see 0.1% or one mg per mil is what's recommended. Um, what I found kind of the hard way um, is that you need to make sure that you're not at an acidic pH when coating. Um, so make sure you're neutral or higher. I, previously, when I've done polyolysine coating, it's usually been done in a borate buffer, which is pH 8.5. Um, PBS also seems to work. Um, and the gel attachment works better if the, the gel is, you know, not completely dripping water. If it's somewhat dry, uh, it will attach much better. And what I found is that after attaching to a good polyolysine coated glass, um, you can submerge the gels and they will stay attached over a long period of time. Um, I did this test just by using a few dishes, uh, trying a few different polyolysine uh, treatments. Um, I used a Sharpie to uh, draw the position of the gel uh, on the cover slip and then put all the dishes with gels onto a rocker overnight and let them become agitated and then saw that found which polyolysine treatments worked. I could, you know, basically flip the dishes over and the gels would stick. Um, and then I repeated the test after um, submerging the gels and found that everything still stays attached, which should help for long term imaging. Um, as we heard from the previous talk, low signal is a challenge. Um, as you might have noticed from several of the videos I've shown, my uh, DAPI signal was quite poor. Um, that's, that's been improved since I collected these videos. Um, here's another image with uh, DAPI and a tubulin stain. Um, and so the ways we've been fighting against this low fluorescence in our samples is um, we've been doing confocal imaging uh, with our spinning disk. Um, and what we found between the two different spinning disks is kind of as expected for the CSU-X, which has uh, the pinholes more closely spaced, uh, you have more issues with out of focus light, um, particularly because our 63X uh, objective also isn't um, the ideal pinhole size for that uh, spinning disk. Um, and then we found by using the CSUW, um, the pinhole crosstalk was reduced. We had less background, um, so that performs quite nicely. It also has the larger field of view, which as we heard pre before, uh, is critical for these very large samples. Um, we found that using high NA long working distance water immersion objectives is ideal. Um, and then if you have uh, high QE uh, cameras so that you get as much of the light as possible into your image, um, that's nice. And then go for your normal Nyquist uh, samplings and make sure your pixels are appropriately sized. Um, 
And then because of our very low signal, we've had to use relatively long exposure times on the camera, frequently up to a second per image, um, which also means uh, if your camera has high thermal noise or dark noise, which it accumulates in the image over time, this will be uh, a negative uh, consequence of doing these long exposure times. Um, we've also had to use quite high illumination. Um, we've had to use the full uh, power from our lasers on the spinning disk. Um, this may not be as much of an issue with a point scanning confocal because uh, you don't have to spread all that light out over the whole field of view um, at a time. And then we've also uh, checked for uh, spherical aberration, which is an issue when imaging at depth. And now that we have our samples at this kind of enlarged 3D volume, uh, we wanted to check uh, spherical aberration, which is something that you can uh, correct for somewhat um, with correction colors on objective lenses, um, or if you have a more advanced method to correct spherical aberration, such as adaptive optics, which we do not have available. Um, along the way, I've also found some useful tools. So, you know, DAPI and HOSH can be applied to the gel itself. Um, and then also we've done broad protein staining using the NHS esters, which has been applied in several uh, different papers. Uh, it's kind of been focused on entirely in the uh, pan EXM papers. Um, so we chose to use this ADO 647 in NHS ester. We found that we could use a much lower uh, concentration of staining. And I suspect this can probably be lowered even further um, as long as we use the sodium bicarb buffer that's recommended for NHS ester staining. Because um, I, when I used the recommended con concentration in the paper, um, my entire gel was stained quite lovely at 0647 blue. Um, so I was able to reduce that by a factor of 10, and it could probably be reduced further. Um, another thing I found useful for characterizing samples are to make uh, gels that have fluorescent beads embedded in them. So this is just preparing an expansion microscopy gel in the normal fashion. Just add in your fluorescent beads of choice, probably not the 647 beads because we know those would uh, be damaged. Um, but we were using um, just the Alexa Fluor 488 uh, uh, labeled beads and those survived quite well. And then we're able to check on the PSF of these beads at different um, sample relevant distances from the cover slip, and then adjust for um, the elongation of the PSF in Z, which is demonstrating that there's some spherical aberration. And so we can adjust that uh, with the correction collar on the lens. Um, so yeah, we haven't, we've only just started uh, working with research projects on this. It's mostly been characterizing the samples and just getting the protocol working quite well. So uh, not quite as many uh, uh, research advances, but um, we at least have uh, some characterization of the samples. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I had to discuss here. Well, thank you so much, George. That was, that was a lot of great tips. Um, definitely going to start implementing that when I start. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one came in and asked, uh, Alexandra asked, can you cast these out of PDMS? I'm assuming your samples. Uh, I wonder if that might be talking about the uh, silicone spacers. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, uh, probably. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know if PDMS, um, I've worked with it a little bit before with microfluidics and an old research project. Um, I don't know how that, how they survive the reaction mixture, um, but I think it would be worth a try. Um, these products, at least in the US, were relatively inexpensive. I think you can get a trial pack of like five of these uh, spacers uh, for less than $50. Um, so I, I found that even with this trial size, um, because they're reusable, um, 
I, I think it's a very useful, I find it to be a very useful tool. Oh, wow. Looks like some very good tips in the chat from other people that are very knowledgeable. So that's great. We can um, share the some notes and the tips from the chat as well. Okay. So yeah, um, Izzy responded to that by saying PDMS can work like sponges of oxygen and inhibit or slow the gelation. Hmm. So very interesting. Um, she also asked actually earlier, what is your preferred mitochondrial stain for expansion microscopy? Yeah, so in the images I've shown so far, um, we, we still have the old uh, TOM20 uh, antibody from uh, Santa Cruz Biotech, which is the, the rabbit polyclonal, which is uh, used in a lot of the original early storm papers. Um, that's no longer commercially available, um, but that's the one you know, we're still using it for now. Um, we haven't found a replacement uh, mitochondrial stain. Um, I did also try and enter uh, an ATP beta synthase antibody, which I can find the product number for and send along um, to label the uh, inner mitochondria and found uh, promising results there. I still need to optimize it slightly, but my, what I had hoped to do was to demonstrate, to demonstrate kind of the outer and inner mitochondrial, um, staining in the same sample. Um, All right. And then, then the next question we have is how do you transfer a piece of expanded gel from a dish to the glass bottom dish, and then also keep the cell attached side facing down? Yeah, so that 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 is currently one of the challenges I'm facing. Um, yeah, I've I've used a variety of things. What it's kind of clumsy, but I've actually just been using uh, cover slips, just as kind of like a large, flat, stable surface. Um, but that's definitely something I want to move away from in the future. Um, I haven't used the paintbrush approach. I know that was recommended in the initial expansion microscopy papers, and I see in the chat. That's what's, mm -hmm. that was what was mentioned. So I, I still need to try that. Um, as for knowing that the cell side is down, um, hopefully I, I can accurately transfer the gel. If not, if there's any uncertainty, then I image at a low magnification um, just so that I can like, you know, quickly check with a decent lens uh, whether the gel is flipped and if it is flipped or if I'm suspicious of it, I can quickly flip it like near the microscope and then try again. And then once I'm confident that the facing is correct, then I'll more securely mount the gel. Okay, and then a question from um, Matthew asking, what antiphase are you adding to your imaging buffer? That one, uh, don't think it's actually in the chat. Oh, but. sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah. What antifades are you adding to your imaging buffer? Oh, um, I haven't. I haven't experimented with that. Um, yeah, I haven't added any antifade reagents. That's an interesting idea. I don't think I've. I don't recall seeing that uh, in any of the published papers. Um, yeah, that's that's a really interesting idea because um, for. Uh, fixed samples, you know, we, we frequently use hardening uh, mounting medias like prolonged gold or prolonged diamond, which I, would not be appropriate here. But um, for antifades that can remain in solution, that's an interesting idea as long as it doesn't affect the expansion factor, which I think they'd be at low enough concentrations that it shouldn't affect the gel size. So yeah, antifades are an interesting idea, and I'd really like to see results um, from their use. Okay, and then one last question before we wrap up. Um, how do you reconstitute or store the esters? And um, Tom said they heard the re reactivity is quite short-lived. Yeah, so um, right now I just have it reconstituted in DMSO in the freezer and it's still uh, worked at, at, at a high concentration um, as uh, per manufacturer's uh, recommendations. Um, I'm not sure how long lived the reactivity will be. So maybe maybe this is going to be an issue. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any uh, advice using these esters and other uh, experiments, uh, that would be useful for us as well. All right, perfect. 
So um, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and all those very useful tools and tips. Uh, we're gonna try to wrap up. We're a little bit late, but um, we have, so Claire and I have another poll question just to kind of, as we said earlier, to try to gauge what um, everyone in this group wants to see in the future and you know what um, outcomes or you know things we want out of this group. Um, so I, Claire? I think we had scheduled an hour and a half, so we don't have mm -hmm. to go for the full hour and a half, but I, I hope people are, are able to continue to stay. So I guess we wanted to explore now sort of where, where do we want to go with the group and uh, what are people hoping um, to get out of this user group and, and how do we want to kind of structure things. So I think I'm going to avoid using the, the word cloud because it's limiting the number of people who can go on. So I'll, I'll see if we can find one without a limit or, or pay a small fee or something. But um, I guess one of the, the things I've been kind of struggling with with a lot of the groups I'm in is, is how to share resources and how to communicate. And uh, we had a good example with somebody canceling the Zoom call today. <laughs> so um, I guess from that one, I'll probably, we'll just go ahead and send a calendar invite by email rather than doing a calendar invitation. But um, I just wonder if uh, maybe people want to speak up or put in the chat. Um, what I was kind of thinking right now is maybe we could just use Google Docs and have like a, a worksheet, um, like a Excel type office document where we could have maybe a page on dyes that worked or, or even just a page on, on dyes and people could put in, you know, we could list the dyes and then people could put in comments and very specifically say, you know, with this buffer and this um, model system, this was our experience and so on. Um, we could also have something similar maybe for, you know, tips about how, how to um, store reagents and, and uh, Peter O'Toole and I were talking a little bit beforehand, he was mentioning how he's found uh, the company and the lot number and all of that can also really matter on the reagents. Um, so I, I think one of the things would be, that would be really valuable and I think um, is not done enough is, is putting in what didn't work. You know, so people are not repeating the experiments with with things that are going to fail and really improve the efficiency for everybody. So I was thinking we could have like a um, a work a working document where we could have several sheets um, with different topics that people could add content to, and we could also um, maybe have a website. I don't know about anybody else. But I have a really hard time keeping track of my Google Docs. So maybe we could have a website where we list all the Google Docs links, you know, so people can link into the, the document and put their information in. Um, I just wonder if there's any any other thoughts. We've also talked about Protocols IO as maybe a place to share both protocols that work and protocols that don't work. Um, so maybe if anyone else has any input here, we could open up. Uh, I I would suggest if uh, anybody is uh, willing just to accept any student or I mean visiting uh, um, uh, scientists just to learn uh, how things are done in uh, another uh, laboratory. So I think uh, sometimes it's much better just to look mm -hmm. and have a hands-on. Uh, and probably will take a few weeks rather than, uh, I mean, just trying to repeat mm -hmm. protocols. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great idea. And I think we could also um, maybe on the website, we could list any courses or workshops that, that are going on with expansion. And I would just mention uh, on that note that both Bioimaging North America and Global Bioimaging have funding for people to visit labs uh, mm -hmm. for just this type of reason. So in the global bioimaging, they call it the job shadow program. And you can list your facility or your lab as a place where people can visit. And then you can also apply. Mm -hmm. And then uh, bioimaging North America hasn't really ramped up the program since COVID, but there's, you know, plans in the works to, to do some pilots and get moving on that um, as well. And it's uh, called exchange of expertise visits. So that's a great idea. And, and there is some funding for that. So Mm-hmm. Good. So there's a comment here from Tom on open discussions. And I, I think um, 
uh, Pete and I talked a little bit before the meeting as well, whether um, people think we should maybe just do that on the confocal list. I think there, it's clear there was a lot of interest on that list. Um, most people don't seem uh, ingrained in it having to be a laser scanning confocal question. Um, but if we feel we're going to get a bit into the weeds and it might get a little annoying to people who aren't doing this, we could also think about maybe setting up our own listserv um, and maybe posting, you know, a summary of that to the confocal list on occasion or something like that. Any um, thoughts on that? Well, I, I think we should start within the confocal list and see how things are going. And well, after a period, a reasonable one, we can proceed to just uh, make it bigger or just uh, make it uh, a different one. So, I mean, for the time being, uh, I should uh, start within the confocal list. I mean, this will help also to have another people joining the, the list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I say, I think my only concern would be if we get really detailed, if people will get annoyed, but <laughs> I guess we can start that way and see if it yeah. seems to be uh, um, taking over the list. <laughs> they, they can always kick us out, can't they? Or, or ask for it to be. Yeah. Developed. Yeah. I do think there's a lot of people on the Confocal list who are interested who may not have signed up for the group. So I, I think it would be a good way to start. So maybe what people could do is put expansion microscopy in the in your subject line mm -hmm. so that people would know right away the, the topic and decide if they want to look at it or not. Mm -hmm. They can filter us out then, can't they? <laughs> Make it easy for them to, to kick us out if they want. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of ideas in the chat. I don't know if um, anybody wants to speak up in particular. It's going by my uh, screen here quite fast. Um, one thing I had thought about was uh, Protocols I.O. So um, this is something that's being supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative as well. And uh, they're very open to publishing protocols that didn't work as well. And the nice thing about that is you can keep it private for a period of time and work on your protocol and use their formatting, um, their web interface and formatting. And then you can invite people to participate in the protocol. And then when you're ready, you can make it public. And once it's public, people can comment on it. You can publish revisions and it will keep track of, of previous versions of the protocol. You also get a DOI number. It's not peer reviewed, but you have a DOI number. Um, so if you do publish with that protocol, you can reference the protocol in, in your peer reviewed publications as well. So I was thinking that that could be something where we could even approach them and see if they'd be willing to open up a space perhaps in their resource for expansion microscopy and maybe collate all of the protocols related to expansion in one place or you know use keywords so that people can can find everything so i don't know i know there's a lot of things coming out in the protocol space and recently and i know um i saw also jove was mentioned in the chat for video protocols. So I don't know if anyone has any general comments there. Mm. I'm certainly open to approaching protocols IO and seeing what might be we might be able to do. And I could then follow back, follow up with the group. You also suggested Claire, you know, just again you can YouTube things quite easily and make them generally available much cheaper. I know you don't get the impact, but you do get the outreach and the, the, the reach. Yeah, we, we had a workshop recently on how to measure impact. And we, we did a, a session on making good videos and, and gave some tips about how to make good videos. And the general consensus of that group was that the additional expense and time that goes into making a professional video didn't really add a lot of value. And people generally felt that people just recording on Zoom or, or you know, making a YouTube video and sharing it was as impactful without the cost and, and so on of doing something professionally. So I'm mm -hmm. always open to chatting if people feel differently. But I, I thought that was, you know, we had about 30 people in the meeting and that was sort of the general consensus that let's put them on the Bina YouTube channel or the, the um, RMS channel and so on rather than rather than spending a lot of time and money on making them really professional. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I guess um, maybe the last, well, two, maybe a couple of last things. So, so one thing is um, we were thinking monthly meetings would probably make sense. I think if we meet more than that, it'll be too much of a burden for people. Um, Mm -hmm. so maybe if if anybody disagrees you could you could put it in the chat or even uh, reach out to me directly but I, I think we would plan once a month um we definitely have a time zone issue we've had a lot of people who are interested from australia and and uh, asia who are not on the call um so i i to me i think the only way to solve that is to have two groups i really don't think there's any way to to meet all the time zones with a virtual meeting um, we could, you know, plan the meetings on the same topic or people could watch the videos and then give comments from the other meeting. I don't know if anybody has any other ideas, but I think once you get sort of the West coast of North America and, and Asia, or Australia involved, it's pretty impossible to find a meeting yeah. time. If you could share like a one page summary of the meeting mm. with the other group, I think that would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess we'll need to find someone who might want to take a leadership role on on running the meetings in a different time zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess the other question would be, do we want to set up just a regular monthly meeting time and then, you know, people come if they can rather than trying to schedule each time. And uh, I was wondering whether we just take this time since it worked out, maybe we can just do the first Wednesday of the month at, uh, 9.30 Eastern time. Works and for me. Then mm -hmm. people can put it in their calendar and if you can't make it, we'll share the recording. So we're gonna share this recording through the RMS uh, YouTube. Okay. And, um, and as I say, it'll just be shared within the group. We're not gonna share it broadly, um, but I think it'll be helpful to have it. And then um, I have been taking notes during the session so we can share that as well. And we can share and there's a lot of great information in the chat as well so i'll make sure to to share that um, and then i guess if anybody's interested in presenting um, um thank you to both of our speakers today for putting something together on relatively short notice um i got a few you know incredible tips just just from your short presentation so i think this would be a good format um and I think I, I really appreciate that both of you shared things that didn't work. I think we've gotten so used to these polished research seminars where everything looks like it was easy and was done in, in uh, you know, with no effort. And, and I know that's sort of the culture where we're trained to do that. But I really appreciate you sharing things that didn't work. And I think it'll really help everybody in the group um, move forward more quickly and more efficiently. So. Mm -hmm. And if there's specific topics you'd like to hear about as well, please uh, feel free to chat or, or email us. Uh, you know, it seems like there's different areas. We could spend a whole session just talking about, um, you know, different aspects of the protocols and so on. Yeah. Uh, two things I would like to point out. Uh, one, if, uh, I mean, about the possibility of uh, bringing uh, people who are uh, more experienced that, for example, mm -hmm. we are just to present uh, their work here. And, uh, well, I mean, that uh, will be very interesting. And the other thing is, uh, I know that many commercial companies are uh, looking into this point. I know this uh, could be a little bit um, challenging, or I mean, uh, well, not everybody will have the uh, same opinion, but uh, I mean, there is a big um, race now to produce uh, better fluorochromes. And I think uh, many commercial companies are succeeding in getting that. So, uh, well, I wouldn't mind to let let them uh, have a chance to just present a few or small uh, talks mm -hmm. about uh, sure. the benefits of their uh, fluorochromes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe this will need some kind of resources. And actually, I don't know. I mean, how we can get some resources to to just invite people or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the RMS has agreed to help us, um, 
you know, with the logistics of planning the meetings and they couldn't make it today, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll ask them to put that in their calendar. And um, I think we can also work with uh, Bioimaging North America and Canada Bioimaging Resources as well as this is a community effort. So I think mm -hmm. it's very well aligned with what those groups are doing. And as I mentioned, there are the travel resources. So I can already kind of imagine a website that, you know, we could either do with the RMS or BINA where we can list, you know, expansion microscopy courses and workshops, protocols, mm -hmm. um, and use that as maybe a starting point. But I, I think your point is well taken to bring in, in some experts, but maybe ask them also to focus on what they tried that didn't work as well. So we, we have the full picture. Okay. I could imagine a session just on dyes. My my background is in physical chemistry, so I'm quite intrigued by is it just the fact that your dyes are four four times you have four times less density, or is it much more? I, I imagine it's a combination of that plus lots of photophysics, and and maybe you mm -hmm. can put these you know um, anti fade reagents in at the end and just let them diffuse into the the gel. I don't know. I, there's I can imagine several PhDs there. So. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. I think uh, unless anyone has anything else to add, I think that was a really productive first meeting. And thank you, Natalie, for all your work in organizing and, and uh, guiding the discussion as well. And, uh, thank you, Claire. And thank you, Natalie, for setting this up. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Thank you all for attending. I definitely learned a lot already. And I think it definitely helps me put like a big step into my master's and I really do want to thank Claire for giving me this opportunity to, you know, speak with all of you very experienced individuals. So I'm very glad. Okay. Thanks. So we'll see everybody next month, unless you're on vacation in August. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye.